Amen. Y'all, let me, let me uh, be a little transparent. And I, and I talk about this before because it's just, it's always something I'm dealing with. That's my health, all right? Dealing with my health and just trying to be fit. And you can see, you can scan through the YouTube screenshots and just see he, he kind of does this thing, all right? He goes down, he goes back out, he comes back down, he goes back out. And, uh, and let me tell you what, what that's about. Why, why, why doesn't it just keep, keep going? Um, it's because I am really good, I, I want to say really good, I am successful in implementing 50% of what I need to do to change, all right? And namely, exercise, believe it or not. I don't have a problem exercising. I go to the gym usually five days a week. There have been times when I'll go six days a week. And I've done different things. And, and, and you can see the change when it's happening, when I'm really consistent with it. Um, the reason it stops, is I overdo that exercise, all right? My body just says we quit at, at certain points. There was a time when I was walking every day, and I'm walking. I was walking six to eight miles. You, some of you heard me talk about it. I was walking six to eight miles every day and loving it. It wasn't a labor. Matter of fact, I felt bad when I didn't go walk. And my body says, stop. And when the body says stop, you stop. Did you know that? All right? If you're young, maybe you haven't hit that, but the body's going to tell you one day, and, and you're going to listen. And so then I went to weightlifting, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing myself because I love to push, and y'all tore the rotator cuff, so I couldn't do that, and it's just something, and something would break down, and then I'd go back up, and then I'd get back on the exercise. So now, you know, instead of the impact of walking outside, I do the treadmill. Do the treadmill. And I'm good with that. Y'all, that works. That's 50%. Do you know that's 50% of what I need to do? Exercise is a part of changing your physical framework. You know what the other part is? Diet. I have a problem with that part. And so my exercising really is offsetting what I'm not doing with my diet. And if I ever put the two together, right, if I could ever be consistent with the two, you would see a long-term change and a long-term benefit. Here, here's why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up, not just for those of you who are, who are with me in that walk with the body. I'm also thinking now about our soul. And, and, and many of us can think, man, as long as I get my prayer life right, as long as I get my Bible reading going, I'm going to be good. And we have this great vertical relationship, this great vertical movement, and it's, man, I'm doing good. But if you don't have an outward expression of what you're getting in the vertical, you're never going to be in the place that God wants you to be. You're never going to be spiritually healthy if there's not both a vertical and a horizontal connection. And so today, I want us to start focusing on that horizontal. We've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about Bible reading. We've even been talking about a lifestyle that fits who we are in Christ Jesus. Today, I want to talk about a different connection, and that's being connected with others through service. And we're going to read about this in, in the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, if you have a Bible, uh, I want to encourage you to go here. Y'all, while you're finding it, let me just show y'all my beautiful, uh, I'm using it as a bookmark. This was a, a handmade card done by our children for me. And they did this on this past, past week. They all signed it. And uh, I believe it says, thank you for all that you do. And they just wrote, and y'all, so this is, this is going to be in my Bible, all right? This is my uh, bookmark for the Bible. That, that was a blessing to me. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to be focusing primarily on 7 through 10. Let me give you a little context in Galatians. The Apostle Paul, Apostle means sent one, by the way, wrote this letter to the churches in the region of Galatia. And y'all, it's a correcting letter. It, it's a rebuking letter. It is not uh, a, hey, how you doing letter. It's a, hey, you're not doing right letter. 
and, and we need to get you straight. And, and what had happened, Paul planted these churches, or at least the initiation of the churches in this region. And after he left, people came in and saying, okay, now that you are saved, you need to follow the law of Moses. Right? You, you need those males, the men in the place, you guys need to be circumcised, and we need to start keeping the Jewish holidays, and we need to do all the things that good Jews do. And, and, and Paul is correcting them in their understanding that, that, these, that the law of Moses didn't save them. Right? Doing the works of the law won't save you. It was faith in Christ Jesus that saved you. And if you're starting to think that I can be saved by my faith, but in order to be sanctified, I need to work, you're missing the understanding of the gospel. That it's all through faith. That you don't live by the regiment of rules, you live by faith in Christ. That is what walking in the Spirit is. And, and so he is correcting them in their understanding. And then he gets to a principle that I really want us to lock in here in Galatians in verses 7 through 10. And he says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh from the flesh will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, I want us to understand this passage, the, the, the context, right? We, the, the title talks about service, but we need to understand the motivation. And, and the Apostle Paul is talking about a principle and he's using an agricultural, uh, I guess, metaphor to talk about this principle of, of sowing and reaping, right? Planting and caring and the harvest that comes from that. And here's what the, the thing that he's saying that we need to lock in. First of all, that everybody is sowing. Everybody is sowing. Every, everybody is, is planting and caring and nurturing, right? You use your energies, your time. Uh, yeah, all of this stuff is going into something. And he's saying it's in the one or two of two places. It's either to your own flesh or to the spirit. Okay? One or the other. When you get up in the morning to when you lie down, you're sowing into one of those fields. And if it's not one of the specific fields, the spirit, then it's not good for you. All right? That's the principle. You may not understand it, but this is the idea. So the question is, okay, I'm sowing by my energies, by my time, by my investment, what I, what I put my money toward. What does it mean to sow to my flesh? Is he talking about skin? He's not talking about skin. He's talking about sowing to your selfish desires, the desires that are contrary to God, the things that wrestle against what the Spirit wants us to do and to be about. And so what does it mean? What does it look like to sow to the flesh? What is, it, what is the flesh? Well, earlier in the letter, he lets us know. If you go back to chapter 5 and you go to uh, verse 19, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it talks about the works of the flesh. And it says, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right? And so it's all these desires that are being manifest in ways that are outside of the will of God, outside of his intended purpose. That is the works of the flesh. So how is it that we sow into these things? It is as you invest time into these selfish desires, you are facilitating what those desires will produce in your life. Let me give you an example, right? So, so married couples, you get into a disagreement, right? And, and there's an anger that has happened depending on what the other person did or did not do. 
And so in your mind, instead of focusing on how to resolve the argument, you focus on how to win the argument. Right? And, and so you're looking to counter whatever the other person said and try to go up and one-up them on your argument. Right? And so you're trying to win the argument instead of to resolve the conflict. And what you're doing is you're sowing into the division. You're putting time and effort in what divides instead of putting time and effort in what brings you together. Right? Y'all, we've done this sexually. Right? You have planned to go out on the weekend to hook up. You made time. You invested money and resources. You knew where to go. You talk, thought about what you could say. And so you were sowing to your flesh in that moment. We can do it with greed and working overtime and overtime, and right, right? And so I'm sowing into these things. And here's the problem, according to Paul. The problem is you shouldn't expect to get a good result out of that. You shouldn't expect to have a blessed life. You shouldn't expect to have more peace and to have more joy when you're sowing in the wrong place. And so this is the principle. What you reap, you will, what you sow, you will reap. Right? A lot of times when we think of, you know, what you, what you sow, you will reap, we use that as, you know, a gotcha, you know, it's a bad thing. But it's not necessarily bad. It can also be a good thing. Right, because Jesus talked about, you know, don't think if I if I sow into a bad a, a, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. You know, you you don't sow a, a, a grape seeds and get a bramble bush. You don't sow a fig seed and get thorn bushes. No, no, bad seed produces bad fruit. Good seed produces good fruit. And Paul is kind of using that same analogy in sowing into the right place. And so he's encouraging them instead of sowing to your flesh. So to the Spirit. What, what does that mean? How do I even do that? I know how to sow to the flesh. How do I sow to the Spirit? Well, let's understand things of the Spirit. Same letter. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at what's called the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, 522. says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, listen to this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. What does that mean? It says instead of putting your energy, your, your time, your thoughts into things that don't, won't do you any good, put your energy, time thought into what will. And, and if the Spirit produces love, let me be thinking more about loving. If the Spirit uh, produces goodness, let me do more good. That is sowing to the Spirit. Hence the response to this principle of, of you know, the sowing to the Spirit. He says in the end of our focal passage, do good to everybody. Y'all remember that? Galatians 6.10, especially to the household of faith. And so here's the thing I want you to remember. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you just with the foundation of the passage. That Here's the thing I want you to remember, that doing good for others is good for you. That's in essence what he's saying. How do we know it's good? We know it's good by what it produces. Sowing to the flesh produces something. Corruption. Corruption. A messed up life. A decaying life. And sowing to the Spirit produces eternal life. It, 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 it's not a secret. It, if I'm spending more time on trying to win the argument, I am not helping my relationship. I am corrupting my relationship. But if I am so focusing on loving rather than living rather than uh, winning the argument then i am now looking to reap more of the harvest of that love which is the life that god has called us to y'all eternal life is not just what happens to you when you go to heaven 
When, when you believe in Jesus Christ, in that moment, you get eternal life. You are a new creature. It's not so much about the time because everybody exists eternally. It's about the nature of that existence. Apart from Jesus Christ, people live, but they're actually dead. The, 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 the nature of that living from God's perspective is no life. That's why Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, I remember a great uh, quote from the late Adrian Rogers. He talked about the things that people do in this world and the desires when we're living according to the flesh and the things that we go to and give ourselves to over and over again. He says that's really the manifestation of dead people trying to feel alive. I want you to think about the things we used to enjoy going to and doing on the weekends and all that, and we thought that was living. And it was just manifestation of our deadness. It is only when we start loving. It is only when we start facilitating peace. It is only when we're encouraging joy, these things that the Spirit produces, that we're now walking in this eternal life that God has blessed us to have. And so, so if you want less corruption in your life and more of the blessing that Christ died and rose again to give you in your life, you need to sow to the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul says one of the ways you sow to the Spirit is doing good to others. Just serve it. Just bless it. That it's good for you. Now, all of us, like I say, have a problem doing what's good for us. I talked about you, you know, earlier about my issues with eating, y'all. There's things I like to eat and there's things I don't like to eat. And vegetables, I do not like to eat. Now, part of my fast, I'm going to tell you what part of my fast was. It was to eat the frozen vegetables in my freezer. They have been there since I've had that freezer. <laughs> Yo, I cook stuff that couldn't be cooked. It was so freezer burned. Uh, it took me 10 minutes just to break the ice off of some of the stuff. Peas that didn't look like peas anymore. Cauliflower that didn't look like cauliflower. Rough eating, I'm going to tell you. But it's because I, I don't like the taste, right? It's not good to me. But often, the goods that are good for me aren't necessarily good to me. Right? If you focus on what's good to me, you're going to gravitate to things that's not good for me. Y'all follow what I'm saying with this? I want you to think about it. every addiction. Almost every addiction begins in recreation. I want you to think about that, right? It starts off fun. It's good to me. It's something that brings me joy and puts a smile on my face, and I engage in it, and I enjoy it. And then it starts to control and to corrupt. But the things that are good for you only bless you for the long run. And the Bible tells us that doing good for others is one of those things that's good for you, that you can expect a good harvest from doing. Some of you are aware about a local pastor. I'm not going to name his name, but he really said something uh, <laughs> that was just, just wrong. And he was preaching to his church that giving to the poor doesn't bless you. What he said was, the only thing you can expect if you give to the poor is to get back what you've given. You don't get more. He says, the only way you're going to give and get more is to give to the church, right? And so he was focusing on tithes, and people were amen. And, and y'all, there's, there's, I think it's Proverbs, is it nineteen seventeen? Ex explicitly says the opposite of what he says. But this passage does as well. You reap what you sow. And you are blessed by being a blessing. 
And it's not a man-made thing. It's what the Word of God says. And so it's great to give to your church, but don't just give to your church. In our church, I think we excel, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those that's complaining. Let me just tell you that. I think we do very well in generosity within the church. I think we do well in regards to people serving. We have a high percentage of people that avail them t- their, their time in some kind of way to benefit the other people that come together. But I want us to expand that and to not just serve in the household of faith, but also to serve those beyond the household of faith. Why? Because it's good for you. It is part of the reason why God saved you. God invested in a whole lot to not just obtain you, but to utilize you. I I was watching um, on, I think it was Instagram, one of the reels came up was a woman who was a hairstylist. And she had her husband sitting in in, in her chair, and she had a pair of, of scissors. And she was asking her husband, how much you think these scissors cost? And so, you know, he knew the fact that there's a camera there and he's being asked, that, you know, these are probably some special scissors. So he says, I don't know, $250, $250. She said, higher. He said, $500. She said, higher. The look on his face changed. He said, $1,000? She said, higher. He said, you kidding me? 1500 higher. 1800 higher. She said the price of those scissors were $2,200. $2,200. I had to ask my own barber, is that real? Was that made up? He said, no, no, those are probably really high quality shears. And she must do a lot of clipping and wanted a high quality shears to do those cuts and those trims. That's a real thing. And here's my question, though, to you. Can you imagine paying $2,200 for scissors? They scissors is me. (laughs) And not use it on somebody's head? Right? What if you put it in a nice box and displayed it? Man, you know, I have these expensive shears. And they can do wonders, and they're sharp, and they don't dull, and they're great. And we keep it in the box. Don't touch it. How wasteful would that be? To invest so much and never apply it. How where are those shears? And God wants us out the box and being used to make a change with people. And so you have to do that. The same way we could plan how to do the wrong thing, we can plan to do good things. So much of what we did and so much of even what we do now is investing in who we used to be instead of investing in who we will be. And so I want to encourage you to start sowing to the Spirit and to do that by doing good to others and expecting to reap a harvest of eternal life, the life that God has deposited in you and the blessings that come with that life. Does it get tiring? The text lets us know it gets tiring, that it can be exhausting that it can be expensive, but it will never leave you in a deficit. It says, don't be weary in doing good, for in due season, you'll reap. Just because the season isn't right now, that just means it's not due season. Right? There's a season when I want things to manifest in my life. There's a time when I really want it. But just because it doesn't happen at that time, don't think it's not coming. Y'all was reading about grape seeds. 
and planting grape seeds. And if you plant grape seeds, first, first of all, you can't use grapes from the store because they may not ever do anything. If you go get grapes from like a vineyard or whatever and you plant seeds, it will sprout in as short a time as two weeks. And so you'll start to see it sprout. But you know how long it can take before you see a grape? Two to seven years. <laughs> wow is correct. But didn't that make you appreciate every grape you've ever had? That it took time. And someone had to have the commitment to keep caring, to keep pruning, to keep watering. Because they knew, even though they didn't see the grapes, grapes were coming. And so I want you to do the same thing. You may be thinking, man, you know, trying to help these people or serve in this way is really not benefiting my life. I'm not seeing any change. Matter of fact, I'm seeing more trouble. Keep caring, keep sowing, keep water, because in due season, you shall reap. Y'all, Clara Barton, um, some of you know the name Clara Barton. Clara Barton is famous for starting the American Red Cross, if you didn't know that. And this woman has his reputation connected with the American Red Cross, but it's really more than the American Red Cross. She founded the American Red Cross after being introduced to the International Red Cross in Geneva, Switzerland. And so how did she find herself in Geneva, Switzerland in the first place? She was on doctor's orders to take it down a notch, to, to not do so much. What was she doing that was taxing her? Well, Clara Barton, got involved with women's rights, with Susan B. Anthony. And so how did she get involved with Susan B. Anthony? It was because she worked with women in caring for wounded soldiers. Not only was she working for women's suffrage with Susan B. Anthony, she was working for civil rights with Frederick Douglass. How did she get involved with Frederick Douglass? She got involved with Frederick Douglass because while she was helping soldiers during the Civil War, she also helped black soldiers. And she had a black woman helping her help all these soldiers. And she got connected with Frederick Douglass. And she wasn't just connecting and helping the wounded soldiers on the Union side, she helped the soldiers on the Confederate side. And before she even did that, some of the things that she did, she knew some of the soldiers she was helping because she had taught them in school. She was a teacher for 11 years. She started the first public school in New Jersey. Why? Because she was next door in another state and realized they didn't have free schools and said, you know what, I'll go over there and teach. And she started teaching at 17 years, years old and taught for 11 years and then finally had one other person join her and they taught 600 people how to read and write. This is Clara Barton, y'all. And she's known for starting the American Red Cross, which was first focused on just dealing with wounded soldiers, it was Clara Barton that says, listen, we don't just need to help in wartime. There are disasters. There's tornado. There's a famine going on in Texas. There was a hurricane in 1900 in Galveston, and she came to help people. So why did she do these things? Because she knew it was good for her. You see, it's not just about the Red Cross, it's just about doing good. And we may not ever see the final result of our good deeds, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's good. And so I want you to walk in those same steps, to follow that example of just doing good where you are. She didn't care and be this nurse because she had training in nursing. She st her training in nursing was caring for her brother at 10 years old when he fell off a barn and hurt, hurt his head, telling you the truth. And my point for bringing that up is whatever you have is enough to help somebody. Whatever skill set, whatever training, whatever resources, you can do good with it. And it will ultimately be good for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for just this blessing of being reminded that we reap what we sow. 
And I'm praying that we're motivated to sow in a new place. That we will take steps of faith if it's just sowing to serve differently in our homes or differently in our church. But I'm praying that some of us will make a big step. That during this time set apart for service, that we will go out into our communities, touch lives in our neighborhoods, and touch lives to do something to help someone else. God, you've given us so much, too much, for it just to be about us. And so I pray, God, that we will be like you. Jesus didn't just come to those who were religious. He didn't even just restrain the blessing of eternal life to the Jewish people. But he told them, when you receive power, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the othermost parts of the world. And so God, it's your intention for us to do good. And we do good because you do good to us. God, I also want to pray, Lord, for the soul that's in this place that is yet to put their trust in you, to live for you, to know the blessing of being adopted into your family, the power of being endured by your spirit, that today would be a day of change for them, that they would encounter the spirit that you call them to sow into. So Lord, bless their hearts to be open, their minds to be open, and that they would apply their will to putting their trust in Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for how you've changed me, and I thank you for these wonderful people that you have connected me to. And I am so grateful for the difference that will be made in the world because of what you have done in us and through us. We love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now listen, you heard me in the prayer talk about some ways to apply what we've talked about. Again, we have those service opportunities at the very bottom of our website. Uh, but I want you to take a step. Don't be a hearer of the word. I want you to be a doer of the word. Amen. And so do something. Do something. And we've already set aside some time for you in Serve Week uh, from November 4th through the 10th uh, for us to do good. And listen, we will reap if we faint not. Uh, again, if you need to make a connection with God, you can connect with us at 832-905-9046. Just text the word connect to that number or also on the website, thewayoflifechurch.com slash connect. And if there's some step of faith, if you want to be baptized on that baptism Sunday, celebration Sunday, uh, use that same method uh, to communicate that as well. Well, listen, gals, uh, we have we only have a couple of more weeks. We have one more sermon next Sunday. The following Sunday, we won't be gathered. We'll be serving. And then our celebration Sunday will be following that on the 17th. So we're almost there. And so if you're getting weak and kind of tapered off in some of your reading, your praying, your serving, listen, we can always get back up and going again. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate your goodness, to worship you. Uh, Lord, may you be pleased as we walk out our faith, not just talking about it, but walking it out. It is for your glory, and you tell us it's also for our good. And so we just thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Yeah.